Hello, my name is Beth Wyman. I'm Commodore of the Inland Lake Yachting Association. My home club is Oshkosh and we sail on Lake Winnebago. We know that the youth fleet of the ILYA is our organization's future. With that in mind, we know that education is important to improve your sailing skills. We are so excited to present to you today, Stephanie Robel and Maggie Shea. They are sailing rock stars and recently climbed to a world ranking of number four and qualified to compete in the Tokyo Olympics in 2021. Now sit back, enjoy, and maybe take some notes. On with the show. All right, thank you Beth so much for the nice introduction and welcome to all of you who joined us today. We're really excited to be sharing this webinar with you all and hopefully you're not all zoomed out right now from online classes, but that kind of seems to be our, our normal right now, but we're just really excited to talk about sailing. I know all of you are getting ready to get back on the water up in, uh, up in, in the Midwest. So we're hoping that we have a bit of a review for you all and then hopefully you can um, come away with something that you learn. So we just want to say a huge thank you to the IOA and to Sales Zing for making this opportunity possible for all of us. Um, I think this is going to be a really fun weekly event for us. All right. so as Beth said, um, Maggie and I teamed up in the fall of 2016 to campaign the Olympics. Um, we sail, we're really lucky we get to sail about 200 days a year, um, and we recently climbed the world rankings to number four. Um, and a really, a, a result that we're really proud of is finishing third at the world championships in February. Um, and also winning the U.S. Olympic trials this year. So we're really proud to represent Team USA and all of you at the Olympics um, in Tokyo 2021. Um, and just to give you a little bit of an insight to what it's like to sail 49er, we have a, a fun video for you guys here. We hope that we can bring our, our 49er to the Midwest for all of you guys to, to hop on it sometime. Um, and again, just a huge thank you to Sales Thing for making this opportunity possible along with the ILA, um, Al Hager and Rob Hudson. They do an awesome job with the website. So if you guys are missing sailing or have a lot any sailing questions, definitely head to that website. They have a lot of awesome resources. Um, and most importantly, our plan for today is to talk about sailing because I think we all probably miss it. Yeah, after watching that, and guys, by the way, I'm Maggie, really excited to be here. Um, I know I sure want to be sailing right now, so I guess the next best thing is to talk about it. Okay, hey, here's just a quick review, because um, I know it's been a while for a lot of us, but just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, these are the points of sale, and today we're mostly going to be talking about either going upwind, which would be the close haul course, uh, you know, the two ones that are about 45 degrees from the wind direction, um, the 90 degrees that is between those two close hauled points of sail, that's where we're tacking through. We like to call that the no-go zone. Um, and so any of the upwind references when we're talking about like sailing upwind and playing the shifts and sailing upwind toward the marks, we are operating on the assumption that we're all sailing on a close hauled course when we're going upwind. So your sails are trimmed in as tight as they can be um, or as tight as they should be. Um, and you're, you're zigzagging back and forth upwind. And then when we're talking about downwind, we're mostly talking broad reaching and running. Um, that's sailing downwind, sails out. And um, do you guys mostly sail windward lord courses stuff? Is that pretty common on the lake sailing? Yeah. Okay, cool. Just making sure. Um, and I don't think we're going to be talking a whole lot about reaching today. 
Okay, so we would like you guys to answer some or to put some um, answers in the chat box about how do we win sailboat races? Just to keep it really simple, like what do you need to do to win a sailboat race? What do you think? Good start, nice. Totally. Don't be shy, no wrong answers here. Communicate okay with your crew, clean up wind, I love it. What else? Nice. Sail fast in the shortest distance, nice. Not take any risks. I like it. These are good answers, guys. Really good yeah. job. I'm liking these. Let's let a couple more come in, and then we'll and then we'll reveal our answers. <laughs> Stay focused. Stay and focused positive. and positive. I love that. So true. Read the wind even better, and we're going to talk about that. Yeah, you guys, these are really great answers. Okay, so know where the wind is coming from. Stay focused. Yeah, keep them coming. We're going to tell you kind of what we think about. To keep it really simple, if you can sail in more wind and you can sail faster than everyone else and you can sail a shorter distance. And so sailing faster has a lot to do with boat speed and sail setup and trim and everything. And we're not really going to dive into that today because that's a whole other talk in itself. Um, but sailing in more wind and sailing a shorter distance are two things that we do want to talk about because that has a lot to do with the wind and how you read the wind and how you understand the wind. And um, so that's what we're going to dive into today. We like to break it down into strategy and tactics. Um, we think strategy is when you are, what, strategy is what you do if you're the only person on the race course. <clears throat> so that's like, how would you deal with the wind shifts and how would you sail the course if it was only you sailing around it? And then tactics is how you execute that strategy with the other boats. So tactics is boat on boat stuff. Strategy is you versus the wind in the race course. Cool. And Maggie and I refer to our strategy as our game plan. Um, for every race, we like to make a game plan. So from this point forward, we'll probably refer to our strategy as game plan. Um, and maybe that's a term you guys can bring forward into your racing as well. But I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about your sailing venue. A lot of you I know sail on lakes, so there's probably land around. But what kind of land is around? Is it mainly cornfields? Is it big trees, big buildings? Um, are there a lot of points of land on your lake? Um, is it a really big lake or is it a pretty small lake? Um, and do you get waves on your lake? Do you get, are they chop or are they swell? Um, does the wind usually blow from one direction? And does the wind speed change based on the time of year? These are all things that you should think about, um, you know, about your sailing venue and things that you can think about before you go sailing. Um, and the first part to making a good game plan is understanding your sailing venue. So, um, we're gonna go through a couple of the different types of, of wind and sailing venues that you might experience um, throughout the course of your sailing career. Perfect. Maggie and I just really like to keep things simple when we're racing. Um, we just have a couple of wind terms that we talk about, stable wind, and then we have shifty wind, which would be um, random shifty, oscillating shifty, or persistent shifty. Um, and then we also want to talk about velocity and pressure. And those are kind of the, the key main wind terms that we think about on our boat. Stable wind, my favorite. <laughs> so stable wind is when the, the direction um, and the amount of wind or the velocity is really steady and consistent. Um, and so I know on Lake Michigan, a really steady condition is usually like a northerly breeze when it's just windy and cold <laughs> sometimes. And it's a really um, steady direction. And it, you don't see a lot of changing where it's coming from. You don't see a big change in how much it's blowing or how hard it's blowing. Um, but it's just pretty consistent and steady state. Um, on those days, we like to just focus on going fast and having a good start. And we don't like to tack too much. We don't like to overthink the shifts because they're not usually that big. But um, yeah, those days we like to keep it simple and sail fast, like some of you guys said in the chat. Good start, be the fastest boat. <laughs> um, and then in, on other days, when we notice a persistent shift, that's when um, a persistent shift is when the wind direction is moving in it, further and further in one way. Um, it would be when like a weather system is coming, you know, a front is coming through. Um, you can sometimes see like, Steph found this great photo of like a big cloud system coming your way, There's a little bit of rain. That to me, that's like, let's get inside as soon as possible. <laughs> um, but maybe you guys are tougher on the inland lakes. <clears throat> but our coach also like to call persistent shifts um, wind rotations, which I really liked. 
<clears throat> excuse me, because uh, I like thinking about it, the direction is literally rotating instead of uh, going back and forth, which is um, the next kind, oscillating. <clears throat> yeah, and just real quick something, Maggie, on the, on the persistent shift is you're going to see a, a big change. You'll, sometimes it's, it's easy to confuse the persistent shift with the shifts we'll talk about in a little bit. So it's really important that you, if you think it might be a persistent shift, you'll see a change in the sky or maybe a change in the wind velocity. We have um, the oscillating wind, which is just wind that goes back and forth. It can, and it kind of works like clockwork. Um, you'll see it in a left shift, and then it slowly will clock around to a right shift, and then it'll slowly clock back to a left shift, and so forth. And so you'll see, you know, every couple minutes, you'll see a, a shift happening. Um, and a big priority there is to set up when you sail the lift attack um, and down when you sail the headed jive. Um, and really just trying to think about sailing the shortest distance possible when you're in an oscillating breeze. Back and forth, back and forth, right? <laughs> cool. And then we have um, the random shifts. And these are my favorite types of sailing days and often what you'll see on a small lake. Um, so actually this photo here is down in Chicago, which I think is a really great example of a time you would see random shifts. Um, obviously, it's not very windy in this photo, but um, random shifts happen when there's a lot of, lot of things for the wind to go through, whether it's a big skyscraper like this, or hills, or trees, or houses, um, islands, whatever. There's a lot of things for the wind to go through, so those barriers cause the wind to have to change in direction and it changes in velocity based on that. And um, my, my, my mentality for days like this is to have, it's a meerkat day. And so those of you who don't know what a meerkat is, it's an animal that kind of props up on its hind legs and, and looks up really, really tall and just tries to find the wind around it. So a meerkat day or a random oscillating day, those are really fun days. And probably what you'll see most often on the inland lakes. I, I think that, Steph, I don't know if you agree with me, but I think inland lake sailors totally have an advantage in these random days because they're used to this like crazy shifting back and forth, roll with the punches kind of style sailing. Do you think that's accurate? For sure. yeah, yeah, for sure. It's funny because usually like when, when one of our regatta days looks like it's going to be one of these random, no one knows what's going to happen, things are going to change quickly. A lot of people in our fleet, you can tell they're nervous and they're stressed out and they're like, uh-oh. This is going to be so weird. You know, I don't know what to expect. And Steph is like, yes, I love this stuff. <laughs> and I think that's a lake sailor in you. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the perfect segue into our next slide. So um, for those of you who don't know, I grew up on Lake Beulah, which I would say, um, going back to the slide where we are thinking about um, describing our sailing venue, I would say Lake Beulah is a rel relatively small lake. Um, it has a lot of points and an island in there as well. Um, so it makes the wind really extra crazy. So here's just a little bit of an example of how we'll often set a race course there. Um, you can see the starting line and the lured marks um, up at the top of the screen. And then at the bottom of the screen, you'll see um, the windward mark. And just kind of trying to show you guys with the light blue arrows, those are areas where you would see more lulls. And then the dark blue area arrows show more wind. So the, the light blue arrows, we'll see where we have wind moving over the land. So um, you can see there's a circle kind of in the middle of the page there that's underneath a huge point of land where you're going to see a lot less wind. And as the wind has more time to build away from that point of land, it'll get stronger and stronger. So again, any barriers on land such as buildings, trees, hills will cause the wind to either to decrease or move really randomly um, and, and have shifts. Um, so I think being able to read the puffs and lulls are really, really important um, when you have a day like this. Um, and Maggie, do you want to talk about how you can read puffs and lulls? I would love to. Um, well, okay, so when we're looking at puffs and lulls, we're talking about the texture on the water. And that's what's going to tell you where there's more or less wind. Um, and that's because if you think about wind moving quickly over the water, there's like a lot of friction and you'll see very textured wind. It looks rougher. Uh, I'm sorry, textured water. It looks rougher um, on, the t on the surface. Sometimes it looks darker, um, but you need to be careful when you're talking about the color because the color of the water can also be dictated by like shadows that the clouds form or depth, you know, changes in depths. Um, and so color is not always the best indicator, but definitely texture can tell you where there's more, the more textured the water is, the more wind there is. 
And the opposite of that is when you see really glassy smooth water, um, you know, like maybe early in the morning when there's no wind at all and the lake is just like total glass, uh, that's, that's less pressure. So more pressure, more texture, more uh, rougher surface, less pressure is a lull and it's uh, that smooth, glossy stuff. Um, hey, Steph, question, how often do you guys have, I mean, are any of the race courses you guys sail on, um, do they have a lot of current? No current on our small lakes. Okay, um, then never mind. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, cool. So we would like you guys to take a, we want some adjectives from you to describe this day of sailing. And we'd love if you type it in the chat box. Like what adjectives do you think? Yeah, great. Choppy from Cali. Totally. Um, Cindy. <laughs> that is very Cindy, true. Cindy, nice. <laughs> Cindy. Really good. Windy. Yeah. Heavier and epic. Definitely true. <laughs> nice. Fun. Fast, fun. Ooh. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> Ab pain. <laughs> what? Love it. Good one. Cool. So when we see this photo, obviously we lived it, so we know exactly what happened. Um, but we can see land in the background. So we have an onshore breeze there. So we are, we're actually sailing in Japan in this photo. And the wind is coming onshore, which means it's coming from the south, just absolutely cranking through the ocean. And so we have a really steady day, so stable pressure, and this, the direction of the wind was really stable as well. But because the, with it being open ocean for so long, the wind caused the waves to really kick up there. And you can see here we have, we're, we have a swell um, with a little bit of chop as well. And because we're fully trapezing, um, we have a nice medium breeze. Cool. Well, <laughs> we are going to have you guys describe this. I guess we, we ruined it for you here. But um, this is a gnarly day. Um, we were sailing in um, Australia where we were actually surrounded by land on all sides, but it was like a really big body of water. It would have been like sailing um, on Lake Geneva for those of you who have sailed there. So um, the wind, the water was actually able to get a little bit choppy um, and it was pretty puffy and shifty because it was coming off the land, as you can see in the background, but the land is relatively low. Whereas the photo before in Japan, you can see the land is pretty high. So if the wind was coming off that land, it would have been extra super shifty. Um, so just going back to that photo in Geelong, you can see it's pretty gnarly there, choppy water, offshore, puffy and shifty. All right, so here we are in um, Italy and you can see land on one side, but we're racing um, upwind with the land on our right. And then we had went the open water, um, open ocean on our left. So it was actually really light air. Um, you can see the crews and the skippers sitting um, towards the middle of the boat. Um, obviously flat water, it was pretty steady in pressure, um, over, or sorry, steady in direction, but more wind closer to land. Drifting, I have to sit in the bow and I, I joke and say it's like my picnic time. And on this boat, <laughs> this boat is usually like really intense physically. And so it's kind of funny to have this one condition where I just like sit there and can't really see anything and stuff has to do everything for once. So <laughs> maybe the opposite. Yeah. yeah, slow. Exactly, Matthew. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so the point of those photos was just to kind of, you know, help you identify how in different venues there's different conditions and different priorities. And um, as we get more and more into these webinars, we'll talk about how in different conditions, how you would um, have different strategy or tactics on the race course, or you, you would set your boat up differently. And so as the weeks build on, we'll talk more and more about all those conditions. All right, so next slide, we're going to start talking about shifts. And this is a really fun topic um, because the cool thing about sailing on lakes is that they are really shifty venues, um, which means a lot of opportunity for making gains. Um, and you always, you always want to be sailing the lifted tack. Um, and so it, here you can see on the left, you have um, boats with the, the wind coming straight down the middle of the course. Um, and you can see the, the boats that are on opposite tacks are sailing even angles. But as the wind shifts to the right, you have the boat that's on port sailing um, the headed angle and the boat that's on starboard sailing the lifted angle. And then in the farthest diagram, you have um, a left shift where you have the starboard boat who's headed and the port boat who's lifted. 
Um, and just looking at these diagrams, the, the middle and the furthest right one, who just acknowledging to yourself who is sailing the tack that's taking them closest to the mark. Um, in the middle diagram, you have the, the starboard boat who's sailing the, the lift or the, sorry, the tack closest to the mark. And then in the right hand diagram, you have the port tack boat sailing closest to the mark. So just important to remember that shifts change the angle that your boat sails on relative to the course. Um, cool. And then this is just a, a fun little diagram to help us see how shifts help you sail the shortest distance to the mark, which is one thing that you guys answered earlier. Um, and is one of our rules for how to win races is sailing less distance to the mark. So you can see here, um, the purple boat has a lot more color on this slide than the pink boat does. So I'd say pink is sailing less distance and I'd much rather be the pink boat in this scenario. Um, and we're gonna, we would say the pink boat is sailing in phase. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard that um, term before. So um, sailing in phase means you're sailing on the lifts, sailing on the shifts and sailing the closest or the shortest distance to the mark. And I love this kind of crazy diagram because it does show stuff how important it is right to sail the lift while you have it um so if we just kind of walk through these boats um like the first position is the two boats at the bottom and they get a right shift um can you guys see my stuff can you see my cursor on the screen yeah. as i'm okay cool yeah so while they're in this right shift here the boat on starboard is lifted and sailing the tack that's clo pointing closer to the mark as opposed to this one over here on port right and then the breeze in the second diagram, so these next two boats, when the wind goes to the left, um, this port tack boat is aiming closer to the mark. So that's a shorter distance. And this one, the starboard tack boat is now aiming further from the mark. Um, and one way we like to think about um, who's ahead and who's behind is imagining that you take a, a ladder and put it on the race course. And this is just in your, in your mind. Imagine putting a ladder in, on the race course and drawing a bunch of horizontal lines, which would be like the rungs on a ladder um, across the race course perpendicular to the wind. Now that allows us to visualize, I don't know if everyone's seen the fancy Stan Honey graphics from like the America's Cup, um, but because we don't have access to those graphic materials, sorry guys, not, not yet for this webinar series, but um, for the sake of understanding and visualizing like who's ahead and who's behind, you know, without being able to overlay that graphically. Um, we talk about ladder rungs in, in like chunks of the race course. So the ladder rungs are, um, they're horizontal across the race course and they're perpendicular to where the wind is coming from. And so on this diagram, um, these two boats are, you know, obviously separated by a ladder rung. And so if they were sailing up wind, then you would know that like the boat on top is, is ahead of the boat below. Does that make sense? Yeah, and you can use this on opposite tacks as well. Um, so that's a really cool, cool tool to use when you're on opposite tacks and coming back um, towards the middle of the race course, being able to tell who's ahead of who um, and talking about those ladder rungs. Totally, good point. Um, okay, so Steph was just talking about the shifts and how they allow you to sail a shorter distance. And I like to think about that as, as like the strategy, right? Like you're trying to sail the shortest distance on the race course. Like imagine you had a stopwatch and you were timing your laps around the race course, you know, sailing on the lift attack would be obviously sailing a shorter distance than the fuel sailing on the header attack. So if you sailed on the lift, 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 that's a shorter amount of elapsed time um, versus header, header, header would be a longer time. Okay, so that's, that's showing you how to sail like the, um, shortest distance around the course whereas we can also think about headers and lifts in terms of um our positioning relative to other boats and packs of boats and so when we talk about shifts and our position um relative to other boats and packs we talk about being inside or outside and so in this diagram let's look at the first at the bottom set of boat a and b so at bottom uh the pair of a, a and b we have B on the outside, and we would say A is on the inside. Um, you could also say A is to windward, B is to leeward. Okay, so now say these boats both get a right shift, and let's look at these two on top. They both pivot, right? They they'd spin up a little bit to continue sailing that close hauled course. And now, um, whereas in the first diagram, B was like a full boat length ahead, instead of being a boat length ahead, they're only like a quarter of a boat length ahead. Uh, does that make sense? So 
A has gained a lot by being inside on that lift. This is also GPS tracking from one of our races in Australia. <laughs> um, <clears throat> is it playing on your screen stuff? Yep. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. So I want you guys to keep an eye on um, the light blue boat that's on the farthest left. It's called, if you can read it, it's Denmark 49 and light green boat, um, Argentina ARG8. So keep an eye on those guys. That is the pack that we would consider inside of us. We are USA 50, the uh, dark blue boat um, right there. So we can kind of, for the purposes of this chat right now, we can ignore Netherlands and GBR because they're doing their own thing here. So as we go um, up closer and closer to this one word mark, I just want you guys to keep watching. I know it's, it's kind of moving slow, but just keep an eye on these two boats that are inside of us right now. Let's see if I can speed it up a little bit. So right now, can you guys see, it's kind of subtle, but there's a little angle change. I paused it. There's a little angle change where these boats are now heading up a little further inside us. So they're starting to get this lift uh, inside of us. And we just went from ahead of them in the rankings to behind them in the rankings. Is this making sense? So they're gaining inside on the lift this whole time and we're losing, losing, losing. It's kind of a painful moment to relive, I'd say, Steph. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we remember this one. Um, and eventually we were like, oh, no, they've really gained a lot. We just have to get up there and get into that left pressure. But it would have been a lot better if we had tacked a minute earlier, at least. You know, if we tacked um, when we were still ahead of them and gotten inside on that lift and then tacked inside of them and we would have just gained more, so. So that's just something to think about. Um, <clears throat> and the opposite is true <clears throat> when you're outside on the header. And let's run through this concept and maybe we're got at kind of like, a, we'll be at a good, maybe halfway like stopping point for questions and move around for a minute. But um, just to, to explain like being on the outside of the header. So again, on this diagram on the bottom, boat B is on the outside and they're sailing along. It looks like boat B is only a quarter boat length or so ahead of boat A. And then they come into this left shift, so they both get headed. And now all of a sudden, boat B is a full boat length in front of boat A. Um, and so that is a gaining, you're gaining on the outside of the header. And that can be one boat or it can be a pack of boats. Um, okay, so we've got some more really thrilling, slow moving footage, uh, mm -hmm. also from Australia. And I want you guys to watch um, GER5, so Germany 5, Denmark 3, and Canada 25. So, Let's keep an eye on yellow, purple, and green. I might speed it up a little bit. So maybe in the chat, if anyone feels like chatting this, who do you guys think is like outside right now, outside of those three boats? Canada, Denmark, and Germany. Okay. Canada from Stacy. Canada, Cali. Okay. Nice. Actually, I think Canada is on the inside. Yep. And Lindsay thinks so. Let's talk about that. I'm glad we asked. Thank you guys for putting those. And when a bunch of people are confused, uh, we could say it's my fault that that was uh, confusing how I explained it. So let's take a look at this. So we've got three boats that are all on port tack. And um, we would consider the windward boats to be inside. So Canada is the windward most boat, so they'd be inside. And Germany, the leeward most boat of these three that are on the same tack would be the outside boat. So for the purposes of the header, which is kind of, spoiler alert, they get headed. <laughs> um, let's keep an eye on Germany. So thank you guys for your answers. I appreciate you telling me that that wasn't super clear. All right. I'm gonna speed this up here. Now, can you guys see that Germany has jumped Canada and Denmark in the rankings and is also kind of increasing the distance in front of them here, especially as we get towards the very top of the beat. Okay, um, cool. So I think now is a good chance for us to stop and take some questions. Um, Steph, do you want to? Do you I don't do have anything right now, but um, we'll just kind of let people type in any questions you might have. 
to recap, Kate is saying inside on lifts, outside on headers. And yes, Kate, that is totally the point. Exactly. You want to be on the inside of a lift and the outside of a header. Um, and then Noah asks, asks a great question about how does the look of puffs change with water temperature and air temperature? In the fall, for those of you who have, any, have done um, any sailing, when the, when, the, when the air is really cold and the water is quite warm still from the summer, um, you'll see like really like when the air is cold, the, the puffs hit like really hard. Um, and they'll, they're, they're, just, they're a lot more dense. Whereas in the summer, the puffs are like a little bit lighter because they're, it's a warmer environment and the, the water is warmer. So it's just not hitting your, your boat as hard, I would say. Like a, a 15 knot day on a, a hot summer day might not feel as windy as a 15 knot day in, in I don't know, 50 degrees. Um, so I think it feels different, but um, if you're asking about like, do puffs and lulls look different based on the temperature? I would say you're still looking for the same sort of te uh, texture changes in the water. Cool. And then we have someone ask us if we've ever caught port tech the fleet. <laughs> it's a good question. Ooh. Yeah, I'd say starting on port and actually crossing the fleet and our fleet is pretty hard, but a common thing that we'll do is start on port and, and do a rabbit start on the fleet, um, which is a fun move and um, you, you, it's a lot easier to start in phase when you start on port and duck the fleet like that. Um, and you can often find a, a little spot um, on all the boats that are starting on starboard. If you're starting on port, you can find a little a break in those boats and try to try to punch through. Um, that's a fun way to port tax start in our fleet. Yeah, and I would also add, that's a good point that um, because skips are so uh, slow to tack, like we go from going eight and a half knots on one board or 10 knots on one, uh, on one board to like zero, 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 zero to 10 on the other board, you know? So it's, you lose a lot of distance and time when you tack in a 49er. So instead of like starting on starboard and tacking onto port, our fleet will frequently like start on port and duck everyone um, in order to get to the right side instead of planning to tack early. Um, and I think that's a pretty skiff specific thing. What do you think, Steph? Is that pretty accurate? Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. It's just that tacks are so expensive. <laughs> um, so instead of, instead of port tacking the fleet, I think it's more common that you'll see someone try to duck the fleet. So they'll be like reaching under all the boats that are kind of stopped or in the middle of their accelerations. And they'll be reaching under all the boats doing like 12 or 14 knots. <laughs> and then they'll just duck the boat going duck all the boats going like Mach 8 and then head up at the boat at the committee boat and like send it out to the right side um it's a fun move to pull off <laughs> yeah it's fun it takes a lot of t um calibrating the time and distance uh and like how far we need to be before we start going full speed because it's hard to like slow down when you're reaching <laughs> um so that's been kind of fun okay i like this question what color is our boat <laughs> um our boats are all white and we have big red stickers on them that say Kilroy. Um, and we also have a red sticker on the back that says LBYC, for the LBYC Virgie. Um, but all of those boats come out of the factory and they're just all plain white. Well, we have a couple more questions in the Q&A. Um, awesome. When on the downwind, uh, for the downwind rounding, is it better to round the mark closest to the favored side or go to the one further away and tack right away? Which is better? Mm. That's, that's a really good question from Connor. Um, I would say it's, it depends on traffic a good bit. Um, if you can round and if it's a really like puffy shifty day, you want to round where, first of all, where there's the more wind and then where you can easily get into phase right away. Um, and a lot of times, like it depends on where you are in the fleet too. So if you're in the middle of the fleet when it's really, really crowded, you might want to choose going to the mark where there's just less traffic for you to sail through. Um, whereas if you're winning, you obviously have more options and you can, um, you can round the mark closest to the favorite side or you can um, round and tack right away. So I think, yeah, it's a little bit of a, it depends answer, but I think a lot of it comes down, especially in a big fleet to where there's less traffic. If you're in a smaller fleet and it's easy to tack, then you would definitely go towards the favorite side. And those are good points, Steph. I think I would also add that in certain boats, like in our boat, um, some maneuvers are really hard to do at the leeward mark and they're really slow and difficult. So say it's like, and that's sort of in the really extreme conditions. Um, 
when it's windy, for example, if you're slightly overstood to the mark, it's going to be really hard to be overstood, get the kite down, jibe around, and have a good fast rounding. And so in those times, I think we would say maneuver-wise, if we have a choice, if, if all things are relatively equal, then we would go for the easier maneuver. Or maybe I just think you do that sometimes, stuff. <laughs> Cool. We have a lot of questions pouring in, which is awesome. So thank you, everyone. We're going to answer one more that's shift specific, shift specific um, and then we're going to go into some more of our slides, and then we'll come back to any other questions that you guys have. I see some about pre-start routines and other stuff, so we'll get to those um, at the end, and we'll just continue on um, here. We have, if there is a shift, do you wait a certain amount of time before deciding if you should actually tack? And so... That's a really good question. Um, I would say the, the kind of checklist that I go through in my head is, okay, if we, if we start getting, um, if we start getting headed, are we in the most pressure or is there more pressure to come with this shift? So if we're in the max pressure, um, obviously then I look over my shoulder. Okay. Are we clear to tack? Okay. If we're clear to tack, we go right away. If we're in the most pressure, but we aren't clear to tack, then we need to make it, so that we can tack, which is to sail into a higher mode and maybe pinch the boat off on our hip so that they're forced to tack. Um, or if we're sailing along and we think there's more pressure and a or more wind in a little bit, we'll wait to tack um, and then you get even more time to make sure that your lane on the other board is clear. And I, I think I also to add to that stuff, um, Jan, it's a great question and it really also gets to uh, the question of like, what kind of day is it? And if it's a, if it's a persistent shift, um, when we were talking earlier about a persistent shift, just as a reminder, persistent is when it's, it shifts a little bit and then it just keeps going more and more that way and the wind, the wind direction is almost rotating. Um, that would be a kind of day that if you start to get a little bit of the shift, you might want to like dig in and get more of it um, so that you've got a good advantageous position on the boats around you. Because sometimes you're going to get more and more of that, uh, of that like left or right shift the further left you get. And so um, I think on a day that you identify the shifts are persistent, then that would be a day that you're more willing to like dig in before you tack. And in contrast, um, the oscillation days, I think a lot was what Steph was talking about was like sort of the oscillating stuff when you're trying to stay in phase. And like, we'll remind ourselves on those days, like if you get a header, tack, get a header, tack, get a header, tack. And you're just trying to sail the lift, the lifted tack up the course the whole time. Totally. Yeah, so we'll like remind ourselves on the boat and it sounds kind of silly sometimes. We're like, okay, we have to remember, we get headed, we tack. <laughs> um, and then there are other times we're like, if we you know, start getting a shift, we have to be patient. And that would be more of the persistent day or the, when the shifts are smaller and it's pretty steady. So cool, that's a great question. Okay, and then, so this one, we just want to talk about what the course looks like in each kind of shift because it changes um, the geometry of the amount of time you spend on one, one course, uh, one one tack versus the other. Um, so the, the course in the middle is a square course. And just imagine in a perfect world, you start on starboard, you tack once, and then it's really easy to see that we're spending 50% of our time on starboard, 50% on port. Both of those lines are the same length. Um, it would be the you know, same amount of time or the same distance if your speed's the same. Um, and so that's a square course. And that's in a perfect world. And I happen to know that you guys usually sail in like shifty, venues that have wind coming off the land and it's probably almost impossible to always make it a perfectly square course. So we're usually likely looking at one of these where it's not a perfect 50-50 course. Um, in a left shift, if the breeze goes left and again we're starting on port and tacking once, then you can, I'm sorry, starting on starboard and tacking once, then you can see that we're spending a longer amount of time on port than we are on starboard. Um, and the, the opposite of that is if it's a right shift, then you'd spend a longer amount of time on starboard upwind than you would on port. Um, this is helpful to know for a few reasons. First of all, if you're not sure what's happening with the wind, it's a, it's a helpful piece of data, a piece of information. You know, if you're not sure what phase you're in, but the course, say it was square at one point, and now, now you think you spent a lot longer time on starboard than you did on port, um, that's helpful to know. It also tells you um, what's gonna happen on the next leg, but it'll be the opposite. So if you sail upwind and it was long starboard, then your downwind will be the opposite. So you'll have a long port on downwind. And it's almost always a good bet to sail the long shift first, the long tack first, or the long jibe first. Um, 
because in theory it's lifted and if it goes back the other way then it would then the op then the opposite tack would be now long and, and lifted um but that's this is just basically how the geometry of the course changes with the shifts um we like to talk about how much time we have left on each board in terms of percentages so in the square course at the start i would say to steph okay we've got 50 50 and that to us means that we've got 50 percent of the time on starboard and 50 percent on port and then whereas in this last shift i might say like 30 70 and that would mean if we're on starboard tack we've got 30 percent of the time on starboard and 70 percent of the time on port and then to go, just to keep going through this on the right shift it would be 70 30 it's 70 percent of the time on starboard 30 percent of the time on port um, we like to keep the communication really consistent. So the first number you say is always the board that you're currently on. So if you're on starboard, you say starboard first, and um, and then the other, yeah, the other board is the is the opposite. Cool. Yeah, and um, for those of you who thought you were getting out of a geometry class today, you thought wrong. We are <laughs> going to talk a little bit about tacking angles and. Um, I know we've done a lot of course geometry stuff already, but um, talking about tacking angles here is really important because it helps you a lot to understand your ley lines um, upwind. So typically a boat tacks through 90 degrees. Um, it does change a little bit as conditions change. Um, for example, in light air, you, would, you might sail a wider angle and then as the breeze builds, you might sail a, a smaller angle to the wind. Um, but just for explaining purposes here, we're going to say 90 degrees. So you can see the boat on port, if they were to tack on the starboard, they'd be exactly 90 degrees away from the, boat, from the wind. Um, or sorry, 45 on each tack. So then that comes into play for your ley lines. Um, and ley lines are imaginary lines that extend from the mark um, in which you can sail to the mark with doing, without doing any more tacks. Um, and this actually, a, this is a really hard concept and a really hard thing to, to do on the water because you, it's really about feel. Um, but understanding these tacking angles will help you get a better feel for your ley lines. Um, I remember when I was sailing Optus, I was just getting so frustrated trying to, to get ley lines right. And obviously if you're a bit further away, if you're really far away from the mark, calling the ley line can be really hard, especially if you're sailing on a shifty venue, that ley line is going to change a lot as you get further up the course. But if you're only you know, 10, 15, 20 boat lengths away from the mark in your opti, then it might be a, a lot easier to call that ley line. Um, but a good rule of thumb is if you have to turn your head a lot to see the mark, um, then you're probably close, or if not, maybe overstood on the ley line. Um, another tip, you might be able to like, use your centerboard trunk on your opti. If you, that's, uh, that might be like 90 degrees that you could use as a reference point. Um, but just kind of play around with it and just start thinking about those tacking angles so you can help get better ley lines around the course. Um, an important thing to remember though is if you aren't sailing close hauled or if your sail isn't trimmed in all the way, then it's going to be harder to gauge your ley lines. So before you check for a ley line, make sure that you're sailing close hauled and make sure that your um, sail is trimmed in properly. Um, but just wanted to look quick here at boats A, B, and C. Um, boat A, is a little bit under the ley line so they're sailing a bit of a higher mode to to try to make the mark um boat b perfectly nailed it and then boat c is overstood and um, risking sailing extra distance and if they're sailing extra distance on starboard it means they sailed extra distance on port so they could potentially actually be ahead of boat b but instead they chose to sail extra distance and might not boat b, boat b to the winner mark double whammy <laughs> um, and hey, one other point we want to make about ley lines, this is kind of a crazy diagram, sorry, but um, basically when it's shifty, that 90 degree zone is just swinging back and forth and back and forth, right? So it's so impossible to call the ley line from really far away, um, and I don't even recommend trying because I'm going to go back to the previous, uh, the previous one. Like Steph was saying, you could be if you're at the, like the bottom of the course and trying to nail the ley line, you could be on a perfect ley line at that point and then say it shifts and now it swings and you're completely overstood and you're reaching and people that are going to come and tack below you will make it um, and, and you're just going to lose a lot of distance to them or vice versa. You might think you're on it and then have to actually tack multiple more times to get to it. So we don't like to try to call ley lines from too far away if it's shifty because you know things are going to change again. So 
when this comes into play is like when you're at the bottom of the race course and you're thinking, oh, okay, I'm getting headed, I'm getting headed, but I'm near the ley line. So I may as well keep going here for a while and just get to the ley line and avoid having to do two tacks. That can work if you're close enough to the mark and you are confident that you're going to be rounding the mark in what's going to be a lift on the other board. But what often happens is that you waste time sailing on that header and then you get to the, finally get to the ley line and you tack and then the phase might change again. And then now you're sailing on the, on the header again. So if things are changing rapidly, don't try to get onto the ley line too early on the race course at the bottom. Think about more like on a really shifty, puffy day, you're going to be sailing more in the middle and sailing closer to the center line and trying to zigzag up the course and uh, avoid those ley lines because they're just shifting back and forth. So in this diagram, when you've got a right shift, which is this green arrow, um, and this is, this is, these are your ley lines here for green arrow. So you can see that like had the boat tacked a couple boat lengths under, you know, they would be on that one too. Um, so if they are on this black ley line, someone else can tack under them. And if they, if the breeze goes to the left, which is the red arrow and the red lines, then they're going to be under the ley line. So I just want to point out that those ley lines are really shifting around uh, the whole time while it's, while it's going back and forth. Cool. And going back to our rules of thumb and how to, how to win races, um, sail in more wind, sail on the lift attack, and go fast. So these are, again, we like to keep it simple. So these are our, our rules of thumb for on our boat and um, kind of all of, our strat all of our ways for managing the race course with strategy and tactics or strategy and lane lines and all that fun stuff and tacking angles. So I hope you guys picked up something from this chat. Um, we're going to open up the question and answer section now. Um, so you can chat to us any questions you might have. Um, one we had was um, about from Maria, if we have any pre-start rituals or routines. Um, and we definitely do. Um, and actually part of it is checking out a lot of these things. Um, but we're actually going to do it. We're going to do a starting chat next week where we'll get some more into our pre-start rituals and routines. So I hope you guys will tune back in to get our full uh, starting routine. Um, so you Ooh. can bring that on the water with you. What a cliffhanger stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Maria, it's a really good question. And it's like one of Steph's favorite things to do. And it changes all the time, but it's usually a pretty good checklist where we check the angles on starboard and port. We check the bias of the line, which one's favored, which one's uh, unfavored, and we do some practice acceleration. So there's a pretty long list we go through though, and, and we'd love to get it into more detail um, if you guys will come back and join us next week. Yeah. Um, cool. Do you want to do chat cool. questions first or Q&A ones first? Yeah, we have one um, from Stacy Keen, um, or sorry, Avery, <laughs> on her mom's Zoom. When, is, when there's a shift and you're on port tack, and you get stuck, how do you get out of it? Um, and I'm, I'm assuming that this is from um, getting stuck in irons. Like if, if you're sailing along on port and then all of a sudden um, the wind is, shifts really hard to the right and your sail starts flapping and you, your boat just totally stops, it's like the worst feeling. Um, and it's really hard to get out of it because we actually call that getting stuck in irons. Um, when your boat is, is really slow and your sails are flapping um, and then it's really hard to steer to get out of it. So you can actually just ease your sail out a little bit and then pull your tiller. If you're on port tack, you want to pull your tiller really hard um, and give it like a couple pumps to try to get the bow down a little bit more. So basically it just means that you're stuck, you're head to wind, um, and the boat doesn't want to go forward because it doesn't have anything um, pushing it because it's stuck in that um, stuck in that header. I hope that answers your question. It's kind of funny when that happens on our boat because we don't just get stuck in, in head to wind and in irons. We, we do get very stuck. Um, but also our bodies hit the water. <laughs> so if we get like <laughs> an auto attack, like we get completely dunked. Um, and it's, it's one thing that if you're lucky enough to be like sailing on someone's hip and they're going to get into it first, you know, keeping an eye on like the boats just ahead of you and, and saying, okay, they just got a big header stand by, you know, stand by for a big header. And sometimes we'll even like pull up on our trapezes a little bit. So I think in a hiking boat, you'd kind of like scooch in a little bit, you know, and then almost just prepare yourself for what's about to come. Um, and sometimes Steph and I talk about like hedging one way or another, you know, like when those really drastic shifts come instead of like reacting sharply and uh, turning 90 degrees one way or the other, uh, 
will like hedge a little bit beforehand. So it's not such a huge pull on the rudder or such a huge change on the sails. Um, but the other thing that can work too on those, especially in like flat water like sailing is um, like gliding through the shift, you know, is gliding the best word to use stuff or what, what else do we call it? Uh, coasting. Yeah. Coasting, yeah. Coasting, gliding, whatever, ghost riding, whatever you guys want to call it. But um, that's basically like when the wind like either dies or shifts really rapidly, but you actually are going quite fast and you can carry momentum um, on your same line, which is, this is usually for like a header. So you can carry momentum. I think it might be relevant for like the heavier scows that maybe you guys, some of you guys sail. Um, but you can kind of, instead of changing course immediately, you can kind of carry your speed on your normal course and then slowly head down uh, after, after one or two seconds. And you just get a little bit more height out of it. So those are a couple of ways to deal with like a really sudden shift. But I was also wondering, Avery, was your question, um, or Steph, the question might also have been like, when you feel stuck, like you can't tack you know, cause, cause there's a boat yeah. winner of you. Um, and I just wanted to address that because it's something we practice a lot too. It's like when there's a boat immediately to windward of us and we feel like we can't tack because if we tack, we're going to hit them and we're going to be wrong and have to spin a penalty circle. So we practice this a lot. Um, especially on starboard when we're tacking onto port, we practice, um, like dipping down, creating a bit of space and then tacking and ducking all in one maneuver. Um, and I work on, as a crew, if Steph like wants to tack, and, but she asks, okay, can we tack, do I have tack? And I look back and I see someone there. I'm like, no, we don't have tack. If I say no, then we don't tack. But if I say something like, uh, it would be a tack and duck, you know, or, or if I tell Steph to watch, usually Steph actually is watching upwind and, and so she's watching, she'll be like, stand by for a tack and duck. And so just remembering that that's an option um, to either tack and duck or duck and then tack. Um, it, it helps to get out of those situations where you feel like a little bit stuck and you know the boats around you are doing the wrong thing and they keep sailing on this header and you really want to tack. Um, yeah, those are just a couple ways to get out of there. Cool. Um, we have a couple questions about um, downwind stuff and we're gonna do we're gonna do another chat on downwind stuff in a couple weeks. Um, and we'll do a speed chat with that as well. But just in general, um, we have a question about what helps um, the most with our downwind speed. Um, what helps the most with our downwind speed? And then what do you recommend doing on the downwind mark if you pick the non-favored mark? Um, so I would say downwind speed, that's, that's a feel thing. Um, you really, I think, sure, I think telltales are the easiest way to help with downwind speed. Um, making sure your sail is in the right position, uh, making sure you're sailing the right angle, making sure you're sailing in the right pressure and in, in the most amount of pressure or setting yourself up to be sailing in the most amount of pressure, um, making sure your angle of heel is really good, um, your boards are at a good height, um, and yeah, you're, you're using those shroud telltales. And we can get more into depth on that in a couple weeks um, when we talk more about speed. Um, yeah, just keeping it simple downwind, just those 12 things. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, it'd be great to talk to more, talk more about that. Um, we have another question about when you get hit with a knock, should you tack right away or should you wait to get up to speed first? Mm. <laughs> I think it really depends. Um, I would say, yeah, <laughs> it depends. I mean, that's the, that's the fun and hard part about our sport is there's a lot of things that um, it depends on what's going on. So um, I would say if you're if it's if you're at the lay line and you get hit with a or near lay line and you get hit with a big shift, you might want to tack right away um, just to get going towards the mark. If you um, are really really slow and there's more just a little bit more wind ahead of you, you might want to wait just a little bit. Um, yeah, that's one that kind of that depends. What what do you think, Maggie? Yeah, I think it also um, is your air clean if you tack. Like sometimes a good, yeah. or a, a pretty reasonable reason, or yeah, uh, an okay reason to wait once you've been headed to tack is if your if your lane is not good on the other board, and you're gonna have to be there for a while. Um, so pretty frequently, like if we're coming out of the left corner, if for example we start getting tacked, and we know we're gonna have like a long port back into the middle of the race course. Um, it's worth it to wait a couple extra boat lengths to get a really good lane on the other board. Um, and the other thing I would say is, um, 
Steph talked earlier about, okay, we've got, when you get a shift, asking yourself, like, am I in the maximum amount of pressure? I think that's a good question to ask. So if you're headed and you look three or four boat lengths ahead and you see a lot more like um, rough textured water, it looks like a puff, like there's more coming, then it's worth it to wait a little while. But um, it kind of depends like how drastic the shifts are. If it's a huge header and you're getting headed like 20 degrees, it's not worth it to keep sailing away from the mark to get a little more pressure because you're sailing so many extra boat lengths, um, if that makes sense. So yeah, I, I'm sorry to say that it's sort of an it depends situation, but <laughs> you should weigh the, like weigh your options in terms of clean, clean air on the other side. Is there a lot more pressure if I wait? Is there a pack of boats or a boat that I'm trying to get a positioning on here? You know, like did someone just tack and you guys are both getting headed and now you can tack and be inside on the lift on the other tack? That would be a good reason to wait. But all of that said, like 99% of the time, if it's a day that the breeze is going back and forth and back and forth, if you get headed, you should just tack. <laughs> is that fair? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Oh, I like the one question from Kate about um, tips for trapezing. Um, just a couple quick tips because I know we're almost out of time. I would say core strength is really important for trapezing and balance exercises really help traps trapezing because you're always trying to trapeze on your tip tip tippy toes um, and be as tall and, and stretched out as possible when you're hiking so um working on your core strength and your balance uh really helps a lot but we can get into a little more of that later with the boat speed talks too yeah and that kind of goes into um grace just asked a question about what kind of workouts do you suggest to do during the off season um We've been, we've been definitely having to get a little bit creative with our workouts um, because we don't have access to the gym and we're learning that you can do a lot of different workouts with just your, with just your body. So um, actually one really cool tip is um, we work with a, a program called Sailing Performance Training um, and it's a guy, Mike Kushner, who some of you may have heard of. He's from um, Minnesota and grew up sailing in the Iowa. Um, he actually has a, a program that you can do and they actually right now they have two free weeks um, that you can join and get some programming. So if you guys are looking for some workouts and stuff, you can um, sign up with them sailing performance training or Maggie and I can send out um, some workouts to do as well. But we're doing tons of different stuff. We're doing am wraps, so which is a, and as many rounds or reps as possible. Um, we're doing every minute on the minute um, workouts. We're doing bike, long bike rides to build our cardio. Um, what else are we doing, Maggie? <laughs> All well, sorts think, of stuff, lots of push-ups, yeah. lots of squats. <laughs> lots of push-ups. I think when, you, when you're thinking about designing a workout program for sailing, you have to remember that every crewing and skippering position on each boat uh, demands so, it's like such different um, physicality, you know, like it, the, the needs, my needs as a crew on a 49er, I need to be strong and explosive and have a lot of power in a short period of time because our races are like 30 minutes. Um, whereas like a 470 crew needs to have much more muscle endurance um, and they need to be able to maintain like an aerobic state for a longer period of time because their races can be like an hour. Um, and so, and I, I would say lasers are a little more like that. Lasers are pretty like endurance driven, would you say stuff? And um, but so what I'm trying to say is that like the role you play on the boat and the type of boat you sail really deter should determine what kind of fitness you are um, trying to achieve. But I think some like really good rules of thumb for fitness would be that like your core strength always, always matters. Um, you really can't go wrong with like really focusing on a really strong core. So planking, sit-ups, push-ups, um, twists, bicycle crunches, crunches, <laughs> uh, all sorts of things. And then, um, you know, how strong and powerful you need to be versus how much endurance you need to have will be kind of dictated by the boat you sail. But we also do a lot of um, rowing and biking. So right now, Steph and I both have our bike set up inside. You can see my bike right there next to the couch. <laughs> um, but we both have these indoor bike trainers and those have been really uh, helpful to just get like whether it's 45 minutes or an hour and a half on the bike inside. Um, but yeah, we can do that rain or shine. So. <laughs> cool. We're going to take um, one more question from Ella. It's um, after a bad start, how do you keep a clear mindset and focus on the shifts? Who wants to go first? That's <laughs> a really good question. <laughs> well, I think um, 
a couple little it's, reminders. Oh, go ahead, Seth. No, go for it, Maggie. I think it's always good when you know you've made a mistake to just say, we're moving forward. There's a lot of race left, you know, especially after the start. There's so much racing left after the start that, that you, there's so much time to gain. And so it's always nice to kind of remember that. And that almost ties into something that an anonymous ten, attendee asked below, which was, what's the most important thing to remember as a crew? And uh, I think one of the most important things to remember is that you are really helping set the attitude of the boat. And so those, those moments that you can be positive and you can be proactive and you can be supportive really help uh, your skipper um, and, and just set the overall tech, uh, tone for the boat. But going back to the starting, um, I think clean air is the first thing you're looking for. So something went wrong at the start. And I think the question you should be asking is like, okay, you know, whatever happened, happened. We're forward thinking. we got a lot of time left. I need to find some clean air. What do you think about that stuff? Yeah, that's a, that's a perfect first step. And also I think, you know, the, the mental component of it too, is just like Maggie said, to accept what happened. And then for me, I, I take a, a deep breath and just let it go and, and just start thinking about the next thing that we can do. And like Maggie said, it's how, what, where's the, where's the next clean lane? What shift are we in? Is my boat going fast? Are my sails trimmed right? And just not letting that that bad start get to you. You just have to you just have to let it go and and almost make it a challenge to see how many boats you can gain um, after having a bad start. It's a good question. Yeah, there's um there's a drill that we used to do in college sailing, and it was called the plus minus drill. And you would keep track of how many boats you could either gain, and that'd be a plus or a minus, and they would be losing. And so sometimes when we make a mistake and we're in the back of the pack, I, I think to myself, okay, we're just playing the plus minus role. We're just trying to pass as many boats as we can. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, I do hear Steph do the really deep breath. <laughs> um, and I think you just want to direct your focus on like, how can we get clean air? And so crews, sometimes it's helpful to say like, what are the options? Okay, we can tack and duck. Um, or you'll be able to tack and duck in a second, you know? Uh, or, okay, our lane is actually fine and let's just focus on speed now, so. Totally. Yeah. Cool. That was a really great cool. question, guys. Thank you so yeah. much for the awful uh, input. You know, it really made it fun for us. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. It was really fun to have you all. Um, we hope you guys will come back next week. And if you have any questions, you can find us on social media at Robleshea Sailing. Thank you so much, Maggie and Steph. That was great information. And you gave us some really good tips on how to get an edge up on the competition. Thank you to the sponsors, the organizers, and all of the presenters. And thank you viewers for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. And to rewatch the series, you can go on to salesing.com or ilya.org where, where you will also find information for any of the future webinars. Thank you so much. Yeah.